everyone, and welcome to this panel discussion on the future of platforms. In particular, we're going to be talking about the need for decentralization and uh, decentralized platforms of the future. Uh, we've been having a lively debate uh, backstage before this, so we're going to have a lot of fun here today. My name is Joshua Fraser, and one of the co-founders of Origin Protocol. And as a way of introduction, we're building peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces on the Ethereum blockchain, looking at how we can create marketplaces which are governed by a set of open and fair and transparent rules instead of the whims of corporate rulers like Airbnb and Uber and these multi-million, multi-billion dollar companies which act as single points of failure and extract massive fees uh, from the people who are using their platform. So to kick off a, the panel today, uh, first I'll ask everyone uh, to go down the line here uh, make, introduce themselves in, in just 30 seconds or so, and tell us a little bit about who you are and what you're working on. Uh, and Richard? Hi, hey everybody. So I'm Richard. I'm the CEO and founder of Dream. Dream is a freelance marketplace. We've been live for two years. We specialize only in blockchain talent. All of our payments are in Bitcoin. So we've proved that crypto payments can work uh, and, and generate revenue. And we're very selective on who we have on our platform. Yet, pretty much every day, uh, and this has just been amplified at this conference, we get people who need a team of developers, a team to, to launch a sale, a team to build a D-app. And the whole freelance economy doesn't scale. It's all geared up to hiring individual people. So we're addressing that th with machine learning to scope out projects and to build teams. Uh, our blockchain application is for reputation systems, a payments token, a rewards token uh, for gamification of growth on the platform, and also to incentivize the training uh, of our AI system. We're based in Shanghai in China Accelerator. We've had funding from two VCs, and we are in our private sale at the moment. Gabe. Hi, my name is Gabriel Layden. Uh, I'm a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. Uh, previously, I started a company called Machine Zone, which you may know for our big games, Game of War, Mobile Strike, and Final Fantasy XV, A New Empire. We are working on spinning out uh, Satori, our technology, out of Machine Zone. Um, it is a real-time streaming consensus protocol uh, uh, focused on creating a decentralized order book for the internet. Uh, so we can finally have a public exchange, a public real-time exchange for all cryptocurrencies instead of 1,600 or actually thousands of centralized exchanges managing our cryptocurrencies. So I think right now, as we're seeing, especially the past month, the centralized exchanges are probably the biggest problem in the crypto space, and we need some kind of decentralized messaging layer that will allow us real-time trading across the crypto ecosystem without uh, having to send our, our, our precious crypto assets to these hackable centralized exchanges. Gali. Hi, I'm uh, Gali, CMO of uh, Liberty. Liberty is simply uh, tokenizing data. Uh, we've developed a data trading platform that uh, enables users to extract the data that Facebook and Google have been collecting on them and then we anonymize the data and make it available to all the other uh, advertisers and publishers in the online advertising e ecosystem. Um, our goal is to try to disrupt the online advertising ecosystem because at the moment it is controlled by Facebook and Google because they get a hold of all the data and information. Um, and we want to make that data available to all the other partners in the ecosystem. Um, we are currently also in private cell, and we have a booth outside, so you're invited to go to the booth and learn more about us. David. Hi, uh, my name is uh, David Ham. Uh, I'm the CEO of uh, Scanit Chain. So Scanit Chain is an AR uh, blockchain platform, so we're going to be one of the world's first uh, AR blockchain uh, platforms. Uh, what we do is we seek to kind of redefine the way uh, people search and access uh, relevant content. Um, some of the key use cases um, that uh, we seek to uh, provide or um, solve are, um, uh, you could say, uh, AR uh, 
uh, based uh, shopping and advertising. These are two big ones that we are, we're targeting and working with. Um, and it's, it's a very unique platform where uh, content uh, can be uploaded not only by large organizations such as advertisers and, and brands, uh, but also uh, by individuals uh, who uh, would like to share their content with uh, other individuals. And then we also have the ability for um, consumers of this content to be incentivized or also incentivize uh, producers to create uh, more valuable content. Uh, we also uh, have a booth over there, so uh, if you want to see uh, the solution, we uh, launched uh, the commercial app uh, yesterday uh, on the, the Google Play Store. Um, and come check it out. And Nix, he was, uh, Nix was uh, introduced to me last night as the Jack Ma of the Philippines. So I'm <laughs> curious to hear uh, how he earned such a title. Uh, hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks, Josh. Um, so yeah, I, I'm Nick Soliedo. I run the largest technology company in the Philippines. It's publicly listed. It's called Surpass. Uh, we have a blockchain project called the Open Data Exchange. The problem we want to solve really is that for 80% uh, of the world's internet users, uh, they are not online every day, 30 days out of 30 days. For most of them, they are only online for less than 10 days out of 30 days. Uh, so what happens is they look for free public Wi-Fi or they go on free Facebook. So the vision really of our platform is to make the internet available to all users, uh, rich or poor, so that they will be able to access all of the centralized and decentralized applications that the internet and blockchain technology companies can make available for them. Uh, after this panel, I'll actually be talking more about ODX, so I can dive deeper into the project for all of you later. So as you can see, we have a stacked panel today, uh, and excited to hear everyone's points of view. I want to start, first question, um, you know, the, the title of it, this panel is the need for decentralization. And so I want to ask each of our panelists, what is it about decentralization, decentralized platforms, that makes the most sense. Why do we need it? And as we think about it, I think about if, you know, using the blockchain as a, as a platform and building on top of something like Ethereum or some of these other top blockchains, you're, you're using the slowest, most expensive computer in the world. Why? So we're using parts of the slowest most expensive computer in the world. It, for us, it doesn't make sense to decentralize our whole application. We're using it where it makes good sense for our users, so for identity and reputation systems. So our, our freelancers and our, and our clients can take their reputation to other platforms. They can bring, uh, for example, their decentralized resumes from our block. They can bring their reputation from Endorse onto our platform, vice versa. And I think that's a great thing. Um, Cryptocurrency is a great application. I think ownership of personal data, identities, reputation data, allowing somebody to have a, an identity wallet that brings all your reputations together is a great thing. We also apply a token across our business model, and we couldn't, we wouldn't, in the nature of our platform, the way we're leveraging AI, the way we need to classify data, we wouldn't be able to do that without a token. And also, a fundamental part of our marketing, we wouldn't be able to do that without a token. However, in order for us to rapidly prototype our, our, our product and grow it and understand what's happening, the, the systems don't really exist right now. For example, we use Mixpanel and Google Analytics and Google AdWords and this plethora of marketing systems and tools that just wouldn't, we just wouldn't get those insights in a decentralized app. So I guess we're being tactical at the moment in how we use blockchain. Gabe, do you have any thoughts? Uh, decentralization is extremely important. Um, my, my belief is that uh, blockchains are used for cryptocurrencies and mainly cryptocurrencies only. Uh, we're seeing a lot of attempts to try to contort these things that were designed to manage cryptocurrencies to do other things, uh, dApps in general, and the dApps really don't work. But what we see that's happening in the space is what is working is are cryptocurrencies, cryptocurrency ownership, wallets, and exchanges. Um, and exchanges have become a very negative force in the crypto space. 
uh, and that's because the technology required to decent fully decentralize a modern exchange doesn't yet exist because the ledgers are too slow to trade the way that we want to trade. Crypto trading is roughly 30 to $50 billion a day, so the blockchain crypto revolution is already here. Uh, NASD uh, the American stock exchange market trades about $180 billion a day, so you can see a very clear path for the crypto market to be as big as the US equity market over time. So in order to make this a sustainable market where we're not depending on centralized exchanges getting hacked on almost a daily basis now uh, and destroying the value of the crypto ecosystem because we're losing trust because of these exchanges, we need to decentralize, create decentralized technology that dismantle every aspect of the centralized exchange. Uh, so what we're working on is a streaming consensus for the purpose of messages that do not need to be shared, uh, sorry, stored forever but do need to be true. And uh, so what we're decentralizing is the order book itself, which is the hardest part to decentralize in a ledger. So our solution is an in-memory consensus solution where we achieve consensus extremely fast and then purge the message once we send it instead of storing it forever in a ledger. So these kind of new consensus uh, uh, running in trustless environments are necessary. And over the next year or two, I would say that we're going to slowly dismantle the centralized exchange and we're going to end up saving the crypto market as a result. Gali, so Gabe just said uh, crypto blockchains are only good for cryptocurrencies. DApps don't work. Do you agree with that? I didn't say uh, they were only good. I just said there hasn't been anything else that's worked. To, so today, far. today. For 10 years. Um, I, I think we have a, a, a different view on things because um, we plan to use uh, uh, blockchain as a, w as a way to obtain trust. Um, up until now, the advertising ecosystem has been uh, ignoring uh, the users, so they are not there. Uh, it was uh, just an exchange of value between advertisers and publishers. So I think that the blockchain is the, uh, give us the, uh, the ability to get the users to the front and put them on the front, put them in the driver's seat and get them into the value change in the sense that uh, the blockchain now help us to connect between and create a, triang a triangle between users, publishers and advertisers. So we use the blockchain to have trust between the three, um, to verify data, to keep up of all transactions, to make sure that advertisers will actually pay to the users. So we look at it from a different perspective in that sense. And David, I know you were working um, before with Samsung, doing research for them with private blockchains. Um, why does decentralization matter? And if you're going to have a private blockchain, why not just use a SQL database? Like, what is that? Why does it make sense to have a private blockchain versus just go all in on, on a centralized solution because it's faster and cheaper? Yeah, well, I mean, there are some value in like private blockchains, right? Um, and there is value in centralization, but um, I think where uh, decentralization is really necessary is where in terms of ownership of, of, of data and information, right? As well, um, in terms of interoperability. So if you have a whole bunch of private blockchains, let's just say um, I'm an organization and I have a blockchain in my company, and um, you know, Gali has another blockchain, and Gabe has another blockchain, and we all have private blockchains. Now, we decide that we're gonna work together, uh, and we wanna do something with blockchain. Are we going to build another blockchain platform, or, or are we going to decide to use one of the blockchain platforms that um, you know, we have created on our own? Or uh, do we need to bring in a third-party blockchain to tie in with interoperability? Then what's the point of having blockchain when we have this confusion, right? So um, to have a decentralized platform where uh, anyone can participate and anyone um, can, can either stake their claim or have a transaction or, or, or register information, I think is really important in, in, in how we're moving forward today. So with Scanner Chain, uh, we're not using Ethereum, and I agree with Gabe in that Ethereum has been used widely for cryptocurrencies and for fundraising, and it's done that well. Um, and the question we had in the room was, you know, can it be used for anything else? But 
Um, on Scanner Chain, we use NAM, and uh, why we use blockchain, and, and, and what, how we decentralize is the content that's placed on, on chain is people registering their data, right? Um, registering their content, staking their ownership, and, and um, basically laying claim that this content is theirs, right? Now, if you look at like centralized platforms like Facebook, et cetera, and everyone's all worried about you know, uploading their content and giving control to uh, one central organization, scan a chain, every individual notarizes their content. They are the owner of that content, right? So I think there's big importance in, in decentralization from that perspective. Next, do you have anything to add? Why, why, why should you, why does decentralization matter? Why should you um, build on a decentralized system instead of just a centralized server? I think it's really, I mean, going back to uh, the original sort of cryptocurrency, which is uh, what Bitcoin represented. Uh, many years ago, when e-commerce first started really in the Philippines, uh, PayPal was really the main form of uh, payments for, these, uh, for anything that you shop online. Uh, the challenge is, coming from the Philippines, for some reason, PayPal many years ago, look at the Philippines as a very high fraud uh, uh, transactions, I guess from a scoring standpoint, transactions area, that uh, a significant proportion of the time, my own uh, payments using PayPal were rejected. It was extremely frustrating. Then comes something like Bitcoin, which said, you don't need a central authority like a PayPal to determine whether or not you should be allowed to make a transaction. The principle of the centralization really is, now that we're connected because of the internet, we are able to leverage off the wisdom of crowds. Because you've decentralized decision making, you've decentralized processes, you've decentralized pretty much whatever part of your business model you feel takes advantage of decentralization. Um, I think it's really up to entrepreneurs like the guys sitting on stage and a lot of the people in the audience to figure out which parts of their business model of their industry can be revolutionized because of decentralization. Uh, I, a lot of the scenarios of use have not yet been invented, um, but ultimately once we see strong traction, and I think there was an internal discussion earlier that uh, at present there hasn't really been too many, uh, if any, services that have really stand up, stood out from a utility standpoint. But we know that uh, uh, from my example with PayPal, in many cases, uh, a decentralized leveraging of the wisdom of crowds can give uh, a lot of opportunity for uh, access uh, to people who don't have access to services. I mean, as simple and basic as e-commerce, you're rejected. And I knew I was good for my credit card, right? So, so take an example of Bitcoin where you cited there and Ethereum fits in this category as well. It's pr open source. It's permissionless. You don't have to talk to anyone to use it. Anyone can run anything they want on this global com computer. When we compare it to some of the alternate chains, um, closed source, licenses, patents, how important is it to have an open permissionless system? And when is that relevant? And, and what do you think of people, you know, when people are building on top of closed source chains and, and going on something where you have to, you know, pay a licensing fee to some corporation? Next. Uh, you know, in, in our case, uh, when we looked at our business, the open data exchange, the inspiration was really, uh, uh, looking at how successful a platform like Facebook has been uh, through initially its internet.org program and then eventually Free Basics, where they've noticed that for most internet users in the world, because they are not online every day out of 30 days, by making their service free to serve and paying for the cost of data access, uh, consumers, uh, uh, publishers with strong business models would quickly become the winner in their space because they would have the most daily active users. They would have the most time spent. They would have the most consumer engagement on their platforms. 
but the biggest criticism that that program uh, encountered was that in a lot of markets, people were saying, hey, why does someone, a central authority like a Facebook, get to choose who wins in various categories in emerging markets? Uh, why is Facebook giving an unfair advantage to certain publishers? Um, um, that is violating the principles of net neutrality. So the approach or the application of decentralization for us, for our particular project, is that uh, we do not discriminate. Whether you are a project who is as large as an Amazon.com or you are a uh, project as small as a Nix's Bake Shop.com, you should have equal rights to make your service accessible, ubiquitous, open, and free to serve for as many users as possible. Uh, and at the same time, if you are the provider of internet access, whether you are as big as a telecom company or as small as a boutique hotel Wi-Fi provider, you should be able to participate in that economy as well without us getting in the way and anointing and deciding who gets to participate. But this is really just one of many possible scenarios of use of how decentralization can be applied to make something that already has legs in a centralized world uh, uh, gain even more momentum uh, once you've decentralized it. Gabe, do you have anything to add to that? I know you're, you're building on Hashgraph, right? Uh, Part we, of it. Part we, of it. We plan on um, we're building a trusted stream of information, a, a messaging network for all blockchains to talk to each other, and we plan on processing a lot of transactions. So uh, Ethereum couldn't keep up. I mean, that's the bottom line. And uh, so there are more. Uh, it's you build apps. It, game of War at its peak was processing, which is not that big of a game. It's a big multi-billion-dollar game. But at its peak, it was processing 100, uh, sorry, 1.5 million messages a second. You'd take three hash graphs to do that. Um, and it's impossible on Ethereum. So uh, scale consumer applications running entirely on blockchain is totally impossible. It's just impossible. Um, and that's OK. Uh, I, don't, I, I, I see this kind of movement. I, I see a lot of people raising money off this idea. Uh, not, uh, I see a lot of uh, data plays, but they don't talk about where it gets stored. If it all gets stored on the ledger, the ledger ends up being terabytes and it's useless. So there's just a, it really, w w blockchains are 30 years old, and why we're interested in them is because of Bitcoin and because of all the other currencies. Uh, not necessarily because you can run a lot of apps to centralize, which you can, but you have to be very careful. I do think, however, there's going to be more generations of decentralized technologies that do different things. And right now, the industry is focused on ledgers, you know, faster ledgers, essentially. And then some more logic in the ledger with a smart contract. Uh, we're going to pr be providing streaming as the next, ephemeral, ephemeral data, you know, streaming, real-time data that's not stored forever, but it's fast, right? So there's going to be new compromises and new ways to do consensus for different aspects of applications. And right now, I think we're just, the, the industry is kind of addicted to the ledger and then just applying that to everything. But private versus public blockchains, um, you know, if you're running a, a bank, you probably do want to run a, a, a private blockchain. If you're running but, a cryptocurrency... But why not, why not just a SQL database? What's wrong with that? Uh, because you want to have an interoperable protocol that multiple banks can trust. SQL is interoperable, no? That multiple banks can trust. Um, you want to, or like thousands of banks can trust. Uh, so yeah, they could all agree to just to trust the database and, and maybe they could just put it on Amazon. And the answer is, that's what they normally do. That's what we do today, right? So there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with doing that. I'm just it's an option. But the reality is, is what, what, what's really going on is we're all able to create these trusted virtual currencies now called cryptocurrencies. And that's a massive revolution. I don't think we're, we have a thousand, 2,000 right now. I think we're going to end up with uh, tens of millions. Um, every business in the world, we already have a virtual currency called equity, right? So we're about to take all of our equity and tokenize it. We're going to have fractional ownership of real estate, fra uh, digital ownership of digital goods, video game goods, all kinds of stuff. So I think we're going to end up with tens of millions of tokens, and I, I, I don't see what, why that's a bad thing. Like, why does the ledger need to do more than that? Because that alone is maybe a $90 trillion market. 
and for some reason we want to make video games on a, on a ledger that could, has a potential to unlock a $90 trillion market, and it's like, well, let's make video games. Well, how about we just unlock a $90 trillion virtual currency market? That sounds pretty good to me. So as long, as, uh, the next step is getting all of these things to talk to each other, uh, and then we can, if, we, if, we, if the technology gets there, we can build apps, but right now the technology, uh, you have to be very selective on how your app runs. So I mean, one of the biggest questions I have for everybody with data plays is where is the data stored? Is the data stored decentrally, decentralized as well? Because if it is, you're gonna have a ledger that ends up in the petabytes and it's gonna be useless. Nobody really answers these questions. What do you think of uh, IPFS or distributed file systems like that? Uh, yeah, you can use that. You could totally use that. Um, uh, you can use that, but then we get into security and trust and all these other problems. Uh, none of these things have really scaled. Um, there's a lot of ideas that haven't really scaled yet, uh, so we'll see. Richard, I want to come back to you. Um, you've taken a more nuanced approach on what belongs on the blockchain, what doesn't. How did you think through that, and what are the important things? What do you, you know, what is the important piece that must live on chain versus the part that uh, can be more centralized? So it was more a case of talking to our customers, our users, seeing what was important to them. Um, as I said, it's about personal data. It's important they own that. Also, financial transactions, putting those through smart contracts makes a lot of sense, legal contracts. So it was really through customer feedback, and I don't really see a big customer demand for us to try and compute AI models in a decentralized manner. We the core of our business does need to be centralized. We have sales and customer support, and because of the nature of what we do, we need all of that. So it was it's really where it made sense. And you know, even as um, Gabe was saying, we, I mean, even with the reputation systems, with ERC-725, there is still a lot of unanswered questions about where we store the data. And so was, this, even with something very straightforward like that, there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So for us to even consider trying to build out a complex platform in a decentralized manner like what we're doing, it's just, it's not ready. Switching gears a little bit, uh, Gali, I want to come to you and talk a little bit about navigating the regulatory environment, especially how we, um, you know, deal with new things like GDPR, um, which in Europe is, you know, new laws around how you store uh, privacy data, right to be forgotten, how does that play with things like an immutable blockchain where the data lives forever? Yeah, exactly. It's pretty challenging. Um, the way we, s we look at things is that uh, we believe that in order for, uh, to get mass, massive, uh, mass audience uh, adoption, and I think this is primarily what we are all missing uh, on blockchain, is that um, the masses aren't there. And in order to get there, we need to get some regulatory assurance uh, for the masses in order for them to get in. And, uh, and of course, the GDPR, um, we work in a space where we are not uh, only uh, regulated by the GDPR, which is the Privacy Act, as you mentioned, uh, in Europe, um, that has certain uh, rights and certain terms that we need to follow because uh, we are now uh, tokenizing data and then we also look at the regulatory atmosphere towards blockchain um, so we want to be flexible enough in order to adjust uh, because we know that into the future uh, regulators will come into force um, I was in consensus about a month ago and I heard um, a parliament uh, member of the EU uh, Mrs. Eva Cayley, and she mentioned that uh, the EU is trying to regulate blockchain, but the, the thing is that they know nothing about it. Um, so it's very difficult for them to regulate thing, technology that they don't understand, and there are not many use cases for them to try out and, 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 and understand the technology through them. So I think it's very important that we reach out to the regulators and have an open discussion explain what we're trying to accomplish and then get them engaged to uh, try and get a compelling regulatory atmosphere to what we are all trying to do. Uh, David, a, a question I have for you. Um, for those in the audience who are thinking about building their own platform and are trying to decide, you know, do I build on top of an existing platform that we have today, um, whether it's Ethereum or, um, 
you know, uh, any, anything else that's out there. How do you go about thinking through that process? Do you, do you launch your own chain? Do you fork an existing uh, chain? Uh, or do you just build on an existing platform? Yeah, um, I, I actually have a, a, an opinion on that that I, I share a lot with a lot of people. And uh, I believe that um, you know, the values of blockchain um, are um, very important. And I believe that uh, a lot of the protocols out there all kind of include the, the, the natural, uh, you could say, values of blockchain in terms of the immutability, the ledger, the, the sharing, the decentralization. So essentially, I think if you're, if you're building a solution or if you're building a DApp, I, I, I believe that it should be kind of blockchain ag agnostic. That's my, my perspective, right? Um, so that um, there's always gonna be a very good blockchain protocol. Like there's a lot of good ones out there right now. Why limit yourself to just one, right? Um, you know, so a lot of people are developing something on Ethereum or a lot of people are developing something on, uh, I don't know, let's say Tron or something. But, you know, there's always gonna be a better blockchain protocol that may come out, that may have a better feature function that you're looking for, right? But, you know, the, the essential values of, of immutability and sharing, trust, uh, transparency is all prevalent within uh, the protocols that are out there right now. So I believe that a, a solution or service should be designed to be blockchain agnostic so that you could put something in should one of the protocols for whatever reason uh, not exist, right? And it's kind of goes back to your question about um, you know, open source and open access, right? And should things be patented, licensed, et cetera? I think it's about inclusion and adoption and you know, having those limitations um, limits the amount of people being able to adopt and utilize certain technologies, right? So, uh, and that's my opinion. Some people, you know, who I've spoken with believe that, you know, yeah, you should use Ethereum or you should use Bitcoin or you should use whatever. But uh, my belief is that uh, you should design um, with the values of blockchain, but be agnostic to the blockchain protocol itself. Next, I want to come back to you and talk a little bit about blockchain in regards to emerging markets. You know, we have, what is it, 2 billion people on this planet who don't have, you know, un, unbanked or underbanked, and therefore don't have access to, you know, a lot of uh, existing platforms and marketplaces out there. How does blockchain solve that problem, and, and how do you see that playing out in emerging markets? You know, the reason why uh, there is so much opportunity really in emerging markets is that uh, the typical entrepreneur takes a proven Western business model uh, cuts and pastes it into an emerging market and finds that their, uh, uh, the adoption of that business model uh, uh, will only be uh, beneficial to uh, the top 10 to 20% of the people who live there. Even something as basic as, say, banks. Uh, an entrepreneur will take a branch-based business model for banks. Uh, he'll take it from a, from a first-world economy take it to an emerging market uh, and use a branch-based system to roll out uh, financial services in that market. The unit economics uh, uh, that makes that business model work in, an, in a first world market, they find very quickly, do not apply for the bottom 80 to 90%. The cost, the minimum uh, uh, cost to uh, service a consumer uh, tends to be higher than the size of the transaction an emerging market consumer will make. And so you see in emerging markets, a lot of basic infrastructure is not available to majority of users. Um, in a market like Philippines and Indonesia, 80% uh, of all uh, 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 citizens there do not have a bank account by headcount. 35% uh, of Filipinos uh, have never met a doctor. 98.5% uh, or 97.5% of Filipinos don't have a life insurance plan by headcount. And we were talking about very basic things. Uh, whether it's the internet, whether it's centralization or decentralization, I think the main focus should really be what is best for the consumer, what is a business model that's sustainable, what aspects of decentralization uh, make the most sense, uh, does it save costs? Does it make it more affordable? Does it make things faster? I think the basic questions are the most important questions to answer first. 
Because to the consumer, it's really all about, uh, uh, I've been left by the digital divide. Can a good entrepreneur bridge that divide, uh, ironically using digital as well? And there's a belief that blockchain will play a crucial part, but more importantly, that solution is really invisible to the user. It's the value that's given to them. Yeah. Well, and with that, we're out of time. Uh, you're, next, you're gonna be speaking more about ODX and what you're doing next. Um, please join me in thanking all of our panelists today. I uh, hope you all enjoyed that.